Good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Bonnie Clark for being here, at least virtually, to share her fascinating work with us, and the George, and S, George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation, the SU Provost Office, and Dr. Lynn Vartan and Apex for making her visit in this lecture possible. I've known Bonnie since our graduate school days at UC Berkeley. She was known there for her sharp intelligence, willingness to help out her fellow students, groundedness, a very nice quality in an archaeologist, and for the fabulous parties she and her wife Kathy threw. Bonnie also has Utah roots. I remember bonding with her in graduate school about our shared propensity to garden, can, and put food by. She was born and raised in Logan, where her parents taught at USU. She graduated with her BA in English and Anthropology from the University of Utah, and then went on to earn her MA in Anthropology from the University of Denver, and her PhD from UC Berkeley. Today, Dr. Clark is an associate professor at the University of Denver's Anthropology Department, where she also serves as curator for archaeology at their Museum of Anthropology. A professional archaeologist since 1990, Dr. Clark's work has focused on using the tangible past, artifacts, architecture, settlement patterns, to tell a more inclusive history of Western North America. Dr. Clark's research interests include the relationships between material culture, ethnicity, and gender, cultural landscapes, community-engaged research, and heritage management. She teaches a wide range of classes for the anthropology department in Denver, including historical archaeology, cultural narratives, and anthropologies of place. In the fall of 2011, Dr. Clark was awarded the University of Denver's Teacher Scholar of the Year Award. She is the author, co-author, and editor of numerous publications, including On the Edge of Purgatory, an Archaeology of Place in Hispanic Colorado, Archaeological Landscapes on the High Plains, Denver, an Archaeological History, and most recently, just in 2020, Finding Solace in the Soil, an Archaeology of Gardens and Gardeners at Amachi. Since 2005, her primary and current research focus has been the DU Amachi Project, a collaborative endeavor committed to preserving, researching, and interpreting the tangible remains of Amachi, the World War II Japanese-American incarceration camp in Colorado. That work has been highlighted in numerous venues, including archaeology and American archaeology magazines. This is also the work that she will be discussing with us today, and I think you will find it both relevant, timely, and interesting. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to Dr. Bonnie Clark, who will be joining us there. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you, are we good? Okay, great. Um, I sure wish I could be there with you in Cedar City. Uh, it's one of my favorite places, and um, I hope you're all enjoying a lovely fall as we are. Um, I really appreciate the um, Southern Utah University for uh, this amazing series and um, all who coordinate it, uh, especially Lynn Vartan. And um, thank you for that really lovely uh, introduction, Emily. It's uh, Dr. Dean. Uh, it's fun for us to be able to reconnect about this work. Uh, beauty, innovation, community. These are not the words that we tend to associate with sites of incarceration, like the location where Japanese Americans were confined during World War II. And yet in the decade of research that I've led at Amachi, Colorado's War Relocation Authority facility, my crews of students and volunteers have recovered incontrovertible historical and physical evidence that every day those ideals were lived out behind barbed wire. Next. We have primarily done that, next slide, thank you, uh, through the practice of historical archeology. span It's an interdisciplinary study which combines the traditional evidence of archeology, span which is the tangible remains of past people's behavior with historical documents and personal accounts. It's a particularly effective tool for better understanding elements of the past for which we have written records, but which are nonetheless in the shadows. Next. One of those histories, I would argue, is the forced removal and incarceration of over 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. This history is still little known or understood outside of the Japanese American community. And even within the community, there has often been silence around internment. So this is a shared heritage that is ripe for further study and exploration. Next. But where to begin? 
This story is often started with the attack of the Japanese military on Pearl Harbor, but I think a better place to start this story is with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was the first act of the US government to single out a specific nationality for immigration restrictions. Ironically, it was only subsequent to its passage that Japanese Americans began to immigrate to the United States in any number. Next. The first generation, or Issei, uh, took many of the same labor intensive jobs once worked by overseas Chinese, but also gravitated to agriculture, which many of them had experience with uh, from Japan. And like the Chinese, as Asians, they were classified as aliens ineligible for citizenship. After 1913, such aliens were not allowed to purchase land in California. And after the passage of that alien land law, many other Western states quickly followed suit. Next. And so it is with this background that we have to frame internment. Although it was a reaction to Pearl Harbor, it was built on an established foundation of anti-Japanese sentiment and policy. Next. Enabled by an executive order signed by the US President Franklin Roosevelt, the Department of War established the west coast of the US as an exclusion zone for those of Japanese ancestry, two thirds of whom were born in the US and thus citizens. Once an exclusion order like this one that you see here um, was posted, evacuees had only one week to put their affairs in order. Next. They were allowed only allowed to bring what they could carry. And the decision of what to bring and what to, to leave behind is very difficult and something that we have explored doing archeology. span Photographs of the so-called evacuation are often evocative of the human cost of this turmoil. Next. After being forced from their homes, internees were first housed in makeshift accommodations like this one at the Merced County Fairgrounds. They sprung up nearly overnight all up and down the uh, West Coast and many of them, most of them were in places like this fairgrounds that were never intended to house people. Next. After several months at an assembly center, internees were taken to one of the 10 quickly built internment camps in the interior of the US. One of these is just under 200 miles uh, north of Cedar City, a uh, topaz, which I have called out on this map. This map also shows how the Grenada Center, better known as Amachi, is located in the far southeastern part of Colorado, a semi-arid region known as the High Plains. Next. This map shows how the exclusion zone residents were divided up between the 10 camps. So it's color coded. Um, the areas in magenta and circled in red um, were the source populations for Amachi. These were some of the most important farming areas in California and lots of folks came with significant agricultural expertise. The population from a neighborhood of Los Angeles included uh, many professionals and also horticultural professionals, including professional gardeners, uh, um, as well as truck farmers and produce merchants. Next. The first group of internees were brought to Grenada by train in August of 1942. They were from the Merced Assembly Center in the Central Valley and mostly farm families. They would soon be joined by thousands first housed at the racetrack in San at Santa Anita. Next. The central area of camp was a mile square with barracks to house internees, a hospital, schools, a cooperative store, and areas devoted to administration and military police. It had an urban feel with buildings laid out in a grid of military precision. Next. But it wasn't just any planned uh, community. Like all 10 of the primary confinement centers, the central area of Amachi was encircled by barbed wire punctuated by military guard police towers, which held armed guards. Next. In the three years of its occupation, over 10,000 internees were confined for at least a time at Amachi, although the maximum population never topped 8,000. Still, that made it the 10th largest city in Colorado, almost overnight. And this photograph uh, focuses on what that raw landscape looked like um, when internees arrived having been recently bulldozed um, and built. Uh, it focuses on the barracks blocks, which is also where we've done our work um, in this area of the camp that's devoted to housing um, internees. Each of these blocks um, included uh, 12 barracks buildings and communal facilities that you see in the middle of the block there. The sort of arched um, building was the mess hall and the H-shaped building next to it was the combination, a latrine, uh, bathroom uh, and laundry facilities. 
Um, there was also a recreation hall in every block. Next. Each barrack building was divided into six living units, none of which exceeded 20 by 24 feet in size. These often held large families who crowded into these temporary structures designed by the military and really for military specifications and not so much with uh, families in mind. Um, they were not very well insulated and they were often freezing in the winter and terribly hot in the summer. Next. The people imprisoned at Amachi made the, the way they best they could. They established churches, both Christian, as you see here, and Buddhist, as well as a camp newspaper. Next. People found employment at Amachi um, in the uh, farms and ranches that were outside of the camp and within the camp at the many jobs required to keep it functioning. Next, activities in camp were often quintessentially American like baseball games and picnics, while others had deep roots in Japan, such as sumo and the celebration of the Buddhist Obon festival that you see in the lower um, picture here. Next. The very structure of the camp, however, increased tensions within the community. The institutionalization of meals is a, a really good example. They're an important um, time in the daily life of most families, and that was particularly true of these immigrant families. But in the mess halls, young people, as you see in this picture, tended to eat with their friends rather than their families. Because most of the people in the camp had been raised in America um, but their, and the children, but the parents had not, there was a significant generational divide and the mess halls and other um, institutions of the WRA only um, exacerbated these uh, differences. Next. The location of Amachi in the Arkansas River Valley was chosen as a productive agricultural area and the internment camp was circled with 10 square miles of farms and ranches that were maintained as part of the project. These had been productive areas with existing irrigation and structures prior to the war. Uh, they were taken primarily through eminent domain by the government, which really understandably upset um, the local residents. And that is, and Amachi is actually the only one of the 10 camps where um, that was the fact. All the others, like uh, Topaz, were on public land. Uh, next, on these farms and ranches, internees produced enough that not only did they supply most of the food for Amachi uh, within a, the first year of, of uh, occupation, Excess was shipped to other camps and, actually, and also to the armed forces. After the closing of the camp in October 1945, many internees stayed in Colorado, changing the way that Coloradans farmed. So for example, you see this man stay here holding that beautiful stock of celery. Celery had never been grown at a large scale in Colorado before, Jap before uh, Japanese Americans showed up at Amachi. Uh, next, uh, most internees eventually returned back to California the luckiest of them to their original homes or farms. Uh, but the majority lost their property and they had to slowly rebuild their lives, often avoiding talking about their experience of removal and confinement during the war. So, next. This is what the site of Amachi looked like when I started the, the project. Uh, it is owned by the town of Grenada, um, which is uh, only a mile and a half from the site and it was bought for access to the deep wells that were drilled by the War Relocation Authority. Um, at that time, all but two of the buildings were removed um, when it was shut down. Next. Um, yet in 20, 2006, Amachi was declared a National Historic Landmark, which is the highest recognition of a historic site um, in this country and one reserved for sites of national and even global import. The landmark nomination recognizes that Amachi is a significant resource for better understanding US history. That is because even though almost no buildings remain, many other important physical traces of life in the camp do. And you can see those in these slides. So the concrete um, foundations of buildings, tree lines that were planted by um, internees next to those buildings. Uh, there are also uh, both formal and informal uh, trash dumps, as well as lots and lots of uh, in other internee created landscaping. And so in essence, this site is a time capsule of the experience of Japanese Americans during the war. Next. As an occupation of people relocated because of an their ancestry to a new environmental setting, Amachi can contribute to the study of uh, topics of, of lots of social import, including the expression of ethnic and national identity, life under institutional confinement, and the way that people make places. Next. 
I became interested in the archaeology of Amachi in the year leading up to its becoming a landmark. As a professor um, at the University of Denver, I was relatively nearby and I had the institutional backing to tackle what would no doubt be a lengthy project to study the archaeological resources of this one square mile site. Um, but the project uh, quickly came to incorporate much more. Next. Collaborative archaeology requires a particular commitment to working with a descendant community, to people who see a site not just as history, but as their history. Uh, in our case, that community is uh, the Japanese American community as a whole, but especially former Amachi internees and their families. And for many of them, as you can understand by this uh, picture of, the, of a pilgrimage that, was, that is led by a Buddhist priest, um, the site is not just important, it is sacred. And so to do work there meant that we needed to be respectful and that our work needed to be built on the knowledge of the community about its own past. Next. Uh, so what we've created through uh, more than 10 years of this project follows a new model for doing archaeology. It's one where we strive to make the process of research just as important as the product. Uh, the centerpiece of the project is a collaborative field school, and you see one of our field school crews here, where undergraduate students can learn archaeology and museum skills while contributing to better understanding one of our country's most important historic sites. Master students are also involved both in learning to oversee these crews and also often in gathering data for their own theses, and they are uh, joined by uh, other uh, really important people. Next. So we do uh, community consultations um, before, during, and after work. And this is very common of community collaborative research. So before we ever stuck a shovel in the ground, I um, spent three years talking to people to make sure that our intervention was welcome, that we were, um, our research design would be shaped by community needs, um, and that we needed to talk to lots of different stakeholders. So obviously we began with the people who had been in camp and their descendants, but we also needed to really talk to the local towns folks. Again, they were the ones who were gonna be putting us up and they're the ones who um, sponsor, um, not who sponsor our work, but who you know own the, 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 the site. And so we need to have permission from them to be able to do our work. Um, we also needed to take a lot of time to do fundraising because archeology span is expensive, especially when you've got these big groups of people coming together. But we have been really lucky that, that those consultations have continued over and over again. So um, we uh, have been, uh, this is a photo of uh, two of my graduate students who did their thesis uh, on Amashi and um, an Amashi survivor who we met at, the, at a reunion. And we've been able to be involved in two reunions um, of uh, former Amashians, which have both been just amazing um, experiences. And, and we, it's such an honor that um, people would take their time during this important uh, community building um, to speak to us. Next. And, and partly because of all those community outreach, we have been able and, and so lucky that every year we've been in the field, we have worked with people who are Amachi survivors. So they have come and volunteered their time, usually one to two weeks with us. And um, they add so much to the training of my students who get to hear firsthand stories about um, camp and, and who get to hear about the impact afterwards. Um, they really put a face on the history. And um, I don't need to tell my students this is important because they hear it from their crewmates. Uh, we also bring in volunteers from the descendant community. And um, when possible, we like to be able to have them work in the blocks where their families uh, have, and that adds a particular um, resonance to the work, as you can see from this young man who found a, a, a marble next to his grandpa's barrack and then immediately got on his cell phone and called him, Grandpa, guess what, guess what? Uh, next slide. Uh, really important to the longevity of the site, the preservation of the site is the fact that, um, so we have committed um, to uh, supporting financially each year, at least one uh, high school intern from the local community of Grenada, who are again, the stewards of the site and who manage the, the museum and from uh, Machi descendants. And um, to get to watch them together and um, 
and become friends as these two ladies did in 2012. Um, I, I, I know they still keep up with each other on Facebook. Um, is wonderful because these are the communities who are gonna keep this site um, going in the future. And by being part of the field school, again, they get to learn valuable heritage management skills that um, potentially could be a professional path for them. Next. Uh, we also have a special day. So we have a public open house day every year. And at, at, after a couple of years, we had more and more Amachians come because, you know, it's many of them um, are, you know, all of them are over 70, our survivors. And so spending a week on the high plains is not necessarily something that people are willing or able to do, but many of them wanted to come out and see our work. And so after a while of having them come to the public open house day and maybe not having as much time for them as we wanted, um, we uh, start created an open house day where they could come and we have specific programming for them, which allows them to learn a bit, little bit more about our work for us to learn from them and really importantly for them to, to, uh, to connect or reconnect. Next. Uh, it's really important that we're not just doing archaeology, but that we're also spending our afternoons in the museum. Um, this is great for my students because they get to learn how to do collections management. And while they're doing that, they're helping this local grassroots museum um, uh, properly manage these really important um, collections, many of them given by family members, as well as help um, uh, do more public interpretation. So create exhibits for people who come and visit the museum. Next. So our research focus um, for, on the archaeology has really been these three things, a kind of daily life in camp, which is really important because that's the kind of thing that people don't write down. And yet, especially in a place that's not very normal, that's a way that you create normalcy. So we wanted to kind of understand how the day-to-day the -day workings of the camp were uh, through the archaeology. Um, we also really interested in the internally created landscaping. And, and, um, and that's my particular area of focus. And then we've also um, looked at areas of the site that are slated for site development. So as buildings are being brought back or new signs are being put up that we go in and clear those areas by doing the archeology. span um, And then that kind of general research focus is sharpened each year by the research that's being done um, by my master's students. Next. Our methodology is really, we're, geared in a, to a site preservation and the management of this site. So we do very intensive surface survey. So a lot of archeology span is associated with excavation, but we spend just as much time doing survey. Um, we walk at a close interval, as you can see at these pictures, and we call out every item we find, and then we flag ones for further mapping um, and analysis. And while we're doing that, we're also looking for landscaping. Um, when we get ready to do um, test areas, and especially if we're clearing an area that might be developed, we used ground penetrating radar, which is a technology that helps us see below the soil. Um, it's kind of like sonar through dirt. Um, and it helps us really plan our text excavations wisely. Um, and then when we do do excavations, um, we make the most out of our soil. So we are taking um, analyses to do soil chemistry, we are taking analyses to recover plant remains, uh, macroscopic, um, the kind that, that you can see. And then we also take some that then go to the lab where they're analyzed under a microscope to look for um, pollen and other microscopic plant remains. Next. Uh, we have, we're uh, sort of slowly but surely marching through the site. So we've completed, uh, our focus has been on the barracks blocks and that's because of our research interest in daily life and really in our talking to the community that while we have people who remember being at, at Amachi, we wanna focus in on that evidence of their lives. Um, and so we focused on the barracks blocks and the other public use blocks um, that Amachians have um, used. And then we still have quite a bit to go. So if any of you are interested in the archeology span field school, uh, let me know because um, the, it, we're, we're really hoping, knock wood, that we'll be able to go back um, next summer. Uh, next. So I wanna talk about some of the key results that we've had um, from the project. So the first is um, that we've found all sorts of uh, physical remains of community building strategies. And one of the things that we've seen, so we, I mean, we knew that these were here. So for a great example is the sumo pit. So at the top, you can see, a historic photograph of the sumo pit. 
But when we found it doing um, archaeology, what we could see was just how much work had been put into that. Because what we could see was that they'd carved out an entire hillside to flatten it out and build berms to make this a proper sumo pit. Um, and this is a place where uh, people of all ages came together. It was a really important intergenerate spot for intergenerational um, activity at the camp. Next. We also um, have found evidence for other sports um, at Amachi. And this was one of my favorites. We were doing ground penetrating radar um, in an area that was gonna be developed. And we found a reflection that it, it was clear that the soil, uh, there's a layer of soil that wasn't like the other soil. And so we went in and opened up an excavation unit and we came down on this super hard packed surface. And then we found a big chunk of wood. And then as often happens in our work, that sent us back to the archival data where we, I looked really closely at this photograph and I was like, I think there's a baseball backstop there. And so during our community open house day, a gentleman who lived in one of those adjacent barracks before we'd even had a chance to say anything pointed over there and he said, that's where our baseball field was. And my students were just absolutely ecstatic. And it's that kind of wonderful synergy that happens um, with a community engaged project. Uh, next, uh, we found other evidence of um, investment in community. So we know, for example, um, based on an oral history in one block that uh, a gentleman's uh, built a playground for his kids there. And then um, we found a concentration of toys uh, in the common area of that uh, block. And so we think that that's probably um, where their, uh, their playground was. And we're hoping that we might be able to test this with some further ex excavations at some point. Next. Uh, we've also found other ways that um, the people at Amachi were taking care of their children. So um, we have a, access to a really wonderful instrument that helps us do non-destructive analysis of, um, of metals. It's called an X-ray fluorescence. And what our XRF analysis of the Amachi um, toys has shown us is that many of them are made of metals that weren't available during the war because of rationing. And so what these tell us is that these are toys that kids brought from home with them. So you only have two bags to bring, you, you know, as much, only what you can carry. And they, um, pr they seem to have prioritized over and over again, things that would have made children feel a little bit more comfortable. Next. Uh, so we're doing some continuing research on how those physical remains of the support of community um, compare to other uh, uh, information about social networking. For example, who is in the baseball team in which, in which block mm -hmm. and who's playing each other. And so that is uh, a lot of information that we can get from the camp newspaper, which was published um, uh, twice a week. And so uh, it's, a, it's a promising area where we're bringing in um, uh, these two different uh, lines of data. Next. Uh, something that we see a lot of is the fact that we see traditional practices, but in really interesting and innovative ways. So um, what you see here is an usu, which is a mochi mortar, and we have found two of them at Amachi. Um, mochi is really important um, food. It is a, a it's a smashed sweet rice, sticky rice that you make into balls. And um, some of you might've had mochi ice cream and that the outside part of that, that's the mochi. Um, and uh, it's really important at New Year's. It's a traditional food to eat at New Year's for good luck. And you also put it, if you're Buddhist, you put it on your shrines. Um, and so we found that, the, I love this usu because most usus um, are gonna be either uh, wooden or metal. Um, this one is concrete. And, um, but when we look closely, looked closely at it, and you, you might be able to see this in the picture, probably not, is that you can actually see the lines from the barrel staves. And so what they've done is they've taken a wooden barrel, cut it off, poured concrete into it, and that's how they made their mochi, mochi pounder. Next. Uh, another thing, a, a really important traditional practice that was enabled um, through community investment um, was, uh, 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 soaking in a, in a tub. So bathing is really an important um, uh, traditional Japanese practice. And, um, and there at Amachi, they only had showers. There were no baths available. 
And so we found the foundations for two different structures that we think are ofuros or traditional uh, uh, bathing tubs. And they, this uh, foundation would have supported a superstructure that then would have had a tub um, on it. Um, it was full of, of uh, ash and charcoal. And we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we found this really fantastic bundle of toiletries, which we expect because basically what's happening is people are bathing, they're, sh they're kind of washing down and then they get into the tub. So you get into the tub clean. Um, and then afterwards you would have, you know, uh, done your uh, hygiene regimen. And uh, what was so great about this is that even though this is a very traditional Japanese bath, all of those toiletries are American cosmetics. Uh, next. Um, and one of the things that a site like Amachi um, helps us to see, and, and this is a, a quote from one of my favorite um, anthropologists, Marshall Solins, where he takes that old adage on it, turns it on his head, as that especially in times of upheaval, to, to continue traditional practices means being very innovative. It means being flexible and, and thinking on your feet. And um, so people had to work really hard to, contain, to maintain traditional practices. And one of the favorites that I have um, is this. Um, so ikidori, which is a, called capturing alive. It's a way, a way to bring things into your garden that you can't otherwise bring in. Um, is, it's, a, it's a medieval type of garden design. And we found it in one of these gardens using concrete as, that had been poured on a prickly pear cactus. Next. Uh, something that our work um, has really revealed is that the internees didn't just improve this landscape, they radically transformed it. Um, and our intensive pedestrian survey really reveals just how common and how variable the landscaping and gardens of Amachi are. So in this um, uh, uh, overview map, uh, the yellow are the, um, outlines are the foundations and all of those um, things in purple, those purple squiggles, those are all landscapes, La landscaping features, almost all of them gardens. So many of them um, are at the entrance to the barracks, these entryway gardens. Some of them are in public spaces and they would have been sort of shared by the community. Um, and then others of them are um, were vegetable gardens. Uh, next slide. So when we do our excavations, that builds on the information that we get from the survey. And then we can really um, look at important details like how they're built, um, what the design was like, and what plants were being grown in them. So this is a beautiful sort of formal oval garden. And what we find planted in it though, are transplanted wild plants. And many of these gardens, people are digging up the local plants and transplanting them. Um, into their gardens. It was a pretty um, common thing. Uh, next. And we have found these um, also really um, traditional Japanese um, garden uh, de designs, such as these two, which are both um, miniaturized landscapes, one of mountains and one of islands. And the garden on the left uh, yielded very few um, plant remains, but a lot of gravel. And it was probably uh, mostly a karasansui or dry garden that's typical of a Zen Buddhist temple. Um, while the garden on the right was absolutely jammed with flowers and scented plants and has this little interesting passageway. And it's very similar to the kinds of gardens that you see at tea houses. Next, um, Amachi is built, oh, that one didn't show up, sorry. Uh, you'll have to imagine a bucket full of fish. Um, Amachi is uh, built on extremely sandy um, landform, uh, which is one of the reasons that landscaping was so important to keep the grit down in a region that was just coming out of the Dust Bowl. Um, it is a very poor soil for growing anything other than about yucca, um, but chemical analyses of the samples taken from our excavations indicate that in almost every garden strata, um, there are more useful nutrients than in the surrounding soil. Um, some amendments um, that we've encountered include eggshell, fish remains, um, even iron slag um, from the blacksmith shop. And the fact that they were only there for 70 years and there is still a legacy, a chemical legacy of their care for the soil is one of the most amazing things I think we've found. Next. 
Uh, geological sourcing has allowed us to identify um, uh, many of the stones that were transported to camp, and many of them came from nearby from the Arkansas River, just three miles north. Um, but some of them came from really far away, like the one on the right, which we think um, is a form of quartz that has to come from the mountains. Um, and um, these are a tangible reminder that um, camp was very, th these camps were more porous than most people imagine. And that many people left temporarily either on work permits or for group activities like Boy Scout um, campouts. And these uh, stones are probably a result of those kind of trips outside of camp and then brought back into beautified gardens. Next. Uh, the results of our pollen analysis is just truly surprising. And um, we find evidence of all kinds of plants that would have been very difficult to grow on the high plains, like this one, which is um, canna, which is a relative of the ginger. And it's a tropical plant, it has no business growing on the high plains. And they were, did such a good job of it that it actually blossomed, and that, which is why um, we got pollen. Uh, it is actually a really common plant throughout um, Hawaii, and especially in places where uh, Japanese Hawaiians lived. And there are more; there were more Japanese in Hawaii than there were in um, uh, the, in the continental U.S. And we think that this might have been a way that Hawaiians, um, Japanese Hawaiians, were taking care of their uh, their relatives and friends um, who were in the states. Next. Um, the Amachi Gardens uh, were a way to transform an unfamiliar and institutional environment into one that was much more productive and pleasurable. Um, but the intense investment in um, these gardens suggests, I think, something deeper at play. And my research into both the history of Japanese garden design and of horticultural therapy suggests that gardening was a practice uniquely situated to help people of Japanese ancestry cope with the stresses of being confined. And because in taking care of their gardens, they took care of each other and they took care of themselves. Next. Our robust results really highlight how collaborative research isn't just the ethically right thing to do, it's the scientifically right thing to do. By working with communities of concern, not only are we engaging people beyond the university, we're learning from knowledge holders. And a great example comes from an exhibit where we um, were working with a community member on interpreting this little grader. And um, she was looking through historic photographs and identified that plant as a daikon radish. And she said, oh, well, that's what that's for. It's for making daikon aroshi, which is a, a grated condiment. And none of, uh, like, I didn't know about this. My students didn't know about this. But it was a woman who of Japanese descent whose family um, had been at a different camp, but she knows the Japanese food ways. And she helped us come up with a much better interpretation of this than we could on our own. Next. Um, all of our studies, site survey and excavation, research in the archives, conversations with the Machians who share their experience um, and their families' experiences with us, together these paint an amazing picture. At Amachi, people who were taken from their homes and forced to live in a hostile environment came together and created a new town, one where their children could feel safe and where social institutions were remade. They got by through ingenuity and skill, and they drew on connections to each other and the outside world. And despite being singled out for their ancestry, they did not abandon it, but they expressed it in both traditional and new ways. When faced with uncertainty, they put their hope in each, in each other and in nature. And so that means they've left a legacy of dignity for us, an insistence on their own humanity, despite forces bent on denying that humanity. And I think that's a legacy that we can all learn from. So with that, um, I'd love to uh, take some questions from Lynn. And um, we're going to go, if you could put up the next slide there, I want you guys to um, hear some sources for some more information. And also, I wanted to point out um, the really wonderful work of the Topaz Museum. Um, it's closed right now because of COVID, but uh, they've got great resources on their website. Thank you. Okay. Let's see, we're going to get my mic on, and hopefully, Bonnie, you can hear me okay. 
Thank you so much for that. That was so great. I have just been transported and I feel like through your work, you've just made this place come alive. I feel like I can see uh, and, and feel a bit of what, of what that, that time and that place was like. I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but how did you, and this has captured your attention for many years and many years to come, how did you come to this project? Where, where, where was the entry point for you? Well, uh, I had just moved back to, to Colorado um, and uh, was part of a team where we were um, kind of synthesizing the archaeology of settlements, uh, historic archaeology of settlements in Colorado. And I came across a research report of a, a sort of reconnaissance level survey of this site. And I was just so struck by the fact that, um, you know, again, here are people who are being singled out for their ancestry. They're actually being incarcerated in, in many ways because they're not American enough. And the fact that they're bringing with them, um, you know, th these traditions out onto the prairie, uh, I just, it was, I, I felt, I was really fascinated by that. And then I also um, knew that it was just about to become a national historic landmark, which was, you know, a great, a win for everybody, but more people means often more impact onto um, an archaeological and any heritage site. And so it seemed like a really good time to kind of get on in on the ground floor and um, make sure that the, the really significant resources were protected and better understood um, as movement went forward. Um, and, and my hope was really that some of this archaeology could be incorporated into the long-term um, interpretation of the site, which has come to pass, which is great. Oh, so cool. You, you've also talked about how working on this site has sort of changed the way you feel about, or, or changed the way you work, and particularly with the community aspect of it. I'd love for you to share a little bit about how this work has transformed your overall archeological research and way of going about things. Well, certainly I have to say I had some good, um, you know, both uh, Dr. Dean and I did um, some great training at Berkeley and, and, what, and what a community archaeology project might look like. Um, so it was something that um, I, knew, I knew could be out there. Um, but in, in doing this work, you know, we really often, um, we're so focused on our results. Um, and that's partly why I spent a lot of time talking about our method and about the way that we incorporate community. Because something that has, it just more and more, and especially as I realized um, the the difficulty that members of the Japanese American community often had in talking about this past. And that's a kind of trauma that gets passed from generation to generation. And this was a safe space to talk about that. The field school became this sort of long with, with people who understood, who were out there, who were invested. And, um, and so uh, it, it just, it became more and more clear to me that opening up the process and having as many stakeholders involved and, and really, and, and again, especially prioritizing um, the Japanese American community members and descendants, um, but also the local folks who are there and watching those connections be made between, you know, the high schoolers of Grenada and the high schoolers um, the, who are uh, Amachian, you know, uh, descendants was just so important. And so um, I've really kind of come to shift to think that, again, my process is more important than, or as important as the product. And, um, and it's something that I've had to have a, actually a conversation with my funders about because most archeology span projects, you do it for a while and then they're like, okay, well now you're done and you're gonna do a new project. Right. And you know, my thought is so long as my community wants this project to happen, I think we need to make it happen. And that's a very different sort of thing. Um, you know, the same thing is happening. So we really prioritized some specific barracks blocks when we started um, because they had higher physical integrity or because they fit into our research design. Um, and so, uh, but now <laughs> because we're so integrated in with the community and we bring them out and, they, and we take them on tours to go back to either their own or their family places in camp, um, we got to do all of those barracks. It doesn't really, barracks blocks, it doesn't really matter, um, you know, if they have sort of less physical integrity than others. And some of them do because the, the sort of sand has blown in and has obscured part of them. But it's like, 
the question of when are you going to do my block? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now we're going to have to do all those blocks because it's this sort of it's this commitment we now have to the community that all of their stories are important and that um, this active because even if we don't find that much on the surface, we're going to find it through the conversations. All right. So um, just this last, um, in 2018, uh, during our, our community open house day, we had um, a brother and sister who, who had lived in one of the blocks that we were studying. And we were talking about the importance of, you know, sort of the, the, our, that physical evidence of the supporting of community. And she raised her hand and she said, did you find our tea house? And I was like, no, you had a tea house. Oh. How, how fantastic was that? My students said the look on my face was like beautiful. And so they found photographs for us. We, we had them kind of lay it out on the, and then we, we were able to find some lumber that we think were probably was related to it. But it was one of those things that like archeologically, it, it, it just looked like a lot of different things. Yeah. So it was only with that community feedback that we had an understanding of the importance of it and who built it and what happened in it. Apparently, even though it was called a tea house, mostly it was for the dads of the block to smoke. Oh. <laughs> right. Wow, that's amazing. And so you've spent multiple seasons, multiple summers out there, and I'm and you you probably have a decade or more in front of you as well. Do you have any sense of how much longer, or is it just going to go until it goes? What do you think? Well, you know, at the at the level sort of that we're finishing up now, um, if we keep up the pace, we probably have about three more years of survey to finish up the barracks blocks. Um, so um, I, I really I'm, I'm kind of committed to getting that done. Um, about the time all of that's done, you know, I don't know how many more years I got to work. So. Um, but I, my hope is that um, we've built so much community around this um, that, that it can continue in the future. Um, something else that um, uh, I kind of want to put a plug for, uh, and, and I didn't put it up on the slides, but um, is that right now there's a special resource study um, being done by the National Park Service who are considering adding Amachi as a national park. Oh, wow. And so, they're, um, and so that could really change things too. And um, certainly I've been talking to the park service. It doesn't mean if it becomes a park, we can't continue to do our work, but it will definitely um, probably change um, at least a little bit. Um, but if uh, I will put in this plug that if you think that sites like this are important um, and you'd like to see this site be part of the national park, um, please go and um, check out um, the national park service special resource study and um, make your voice heard. Uh, and uh, because they're looking for people, not just, yet, you know, people who have a con special connection to Amachi, but anyone who thinks that this is an important legacy that, um, that ought to be preserved. Well, speaking of people desiring connections, you know, we may have some students or faculty or community members who are saying, I want to get involved. This is something I'm really passionate about. I want to, I want to see what it's like. I want to get involved and get, you know, get on with the project somehow. Um, how do you get involved with something like this? Are you looking for volunteers? Is there, are there ways to help? How do you move forward if you want to get involved with it? Well, um, for students, uh, we do run an archaeological field school, and um, we run it through the Institute for Field Research, which is open for students um, and in any institution. And so um, that is one way to get involved. Um, we're still a little bit in a wait and see about whether or not we'll be able to do it next summer, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can do that. So students should check out the IFR if they're interested. Um, and then that is a way you know, to, to get involved as students. Um, we do have a lot of research. Um, we're, we're, we're putting a lot of this into a big digital database. And so we're hoping that at some point that will be a resource for students who wanted to do like, you know, like um, independent research projects with that data. Um, so that's going to be something that's coming online, we hope, in the next year or so. Um, in terms of volunteering for the field school, I really do because the, I have a kind of limited number of spaces and I really do reserve that for um, my uh, descendant community and my um, folks who are at Amachi. But if there's anybody who's watching this and, and that is the case, I, I really hope that you reach out to me. And um, that last page there, it had our portfolio, our website on it and um, my contact information 
um, is on there. Um, but I have to say, so so there, I'm I'm absolutely certain that um, the Topaz Museum also runs largely on volunteer labor. And I think if you are interested, um, you should reach, you know, go to, go visit the Topaz website and reach out to them. Um, I'm sure they need research. And in fact, I do know that um, they've just acquired a little bit more of the, I think there's, they now um, have all of the land. They used, there was one little bit that they didn't. Um, and so there's definitely going to need to be, they're going to need some um, help as well. Great. Well, we'll make sure to put those links on the archive page that we will develop for you as well. So it'll have easy access for everyone for that. Um, speaking of plugs, I want to make sure to talk about your new book um, because people may want to get in, you know, get a copy and read and it's coming out really soon. So do you mind telling us, I know we saw the slide of the cover a bit or the slide of it a bit back, but tell us a little bit more about the book and how we can find it and when it's coming out. Oh, great. Well, I'm, I suppose we could probably go back to that. It's not too many yeah. slides back. Slide um, so one. it's the University Press of Colorado. Um, the title is Finding Solace in the Soil, and it should be out in November, December. So um, the next few months. And um, it's uh, a really, I hope um, I've really geared it like this talk to a, a, a wide um, audience. Um, you don't have to be an archaeologist or even a history buff to um, enjoy it. My hope is that people who love gardens will um, pick it up too and um, learn a little bit more about um, this, you know, a big chunk of this. I, I kind of overview the history of, of Japanese gardening because that's really important in terms of thinking about what we see um, at Amachi. I, I, I think it's um, not an overstatement to say that Amachi is Colorado's largest Japanese garden. Ah. Beautiful. And so um, there is, you know, I, I talk a lot about uh, and, and more about uh, some of those gardens that you saw um, in the slideshow here and about the history of the, the people as well. Uh, like this gentleman, um, Mr. Mataji Umeda, um, my students have such a crush on him because he is so dapper and he has that beautiful mustache. And uh, I was uh, lucky to interview his daughter and um, and granddaughter, and there are they're in the book. So um, he was a he was a tomato farmer from Stockton, uh -huh. and um, but he had a apparently a, a, a serious green thumb. Well, you talked a lot about the gardens, and, and it's so true. I mean, you can be a lover of history, a lover of psychology, a lover of sociology, a lover of gardening. Um, you spoke to biology students, and it's all in there. I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating about the work that you do is it's it just covers so many disciplines. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the book. So yay, can't wait. Um, I also wanted to ask you, because I always uh, like to ask, what advice do you have for students? We have a lot of students of, of varying disciplines and at varying levels, and um, you as a professor and a, and a scholar, not just for your area, but what advice do you have for students nowadays um, that you might like to impart today? I think that, um, you know, this has been such, doing this work has been, um, not just fulfilling on a professional level, but on a personal level. And I think figuring out a way to um, spend your time doing something that makes a difference um, is well worth it. And, um, and, I, and I really am an advocate of, of students trying to, um, trying out both, you know, the sort of the scholarly work, but also really the applied work. And, you know, so, Think about the organizations that you care about, the causes that you care about, and think about ways that you might be able to apply your scholarship and be a, be a resource um, for uh, things that you, for the, you know, the changes that you want to see in the world. Great. Thank you. And just a couple of last questions. How has this work on this project in particular changed you in your life? I, I know you mentioned maybe a little gardening or perhaps that's a little more, but how has it changed you in, in maybe how you feel about even gardening, of course, but people and how people treat each other? How is it, has it changed you internally? Well, I will say one thing is that I feel so lucky to work with the community of folks that I do. Incredibly gracious. 
And one of the things that is that I have learned to have better manners. I I will say I'm the fifth of seven children. And I, you know, I I didn't know how to write thank you notes. I didn't know that when you showed up to somebody's house, you should have a token of your gratitude. Like I learned all of that stuff doing this project because they were so gracious. And I learned, I had to learn how to be gracious um, myself. Um, I also, um, when I, you know, kind of get a little down in the dumps, I think about this site. I think about like, what do I do when I don't feel like doing anything? Do I just crawl up in a ball or do I go outside and plant a flower? You know, and so uh, I am inspired on a daily basis by what happened at this place. Wonderful. And then lastly, I'd love to know, are there, are there, current people either working in your field or or in any field really who really inspire you that that or per- perhaps authors that you feel that students should read who inspires you right now well i will tell you um and speaking of the utah connections um as i was working on this project i heard a, um, a podcast interview with terry tempest williams mm. And she was writing a book actually about um, mosaics in and their tradition at, linking back to the Middle East. And she really saw mosaics as this way to create art out of things that have been shattered. And, um, and she had this quote that I, is actually included in my book, which is that um, there are times and places where beauty is not optional. Um, and so if you guys aren't reading Terry Tempest Williams, uh, you should do it. She is fantastic. Um, and, 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 you know, a lot of what she writes is about the Utah landscape. And um, she, is, she is one of my heroes. Absolutely. That's ama- that is the third time this week that she has been mentioned in a conversation. It's just, <laughs> so I'm telling you, everyone, we definitely need to be reading. I mean, because that's just so funny. That's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. Well, that's just about all the time that we have today. As I said, we will put the links for everything on. Um, Bonnie and I will be on the radio uh, at 3 p.m. today, uh, Mountain Standard Time, KSUU Thunder 91.1. And we will also be turning that into a podcast uh, that you can listen to later. We'll get into some more details about everything. Uh, In the meantime, I want to say thank you to everyone who is here. Thank you to everyone who is watching remotely. And thank you so much to Dr. Clark for your time and your generosity and for speaking to the students and for being here with us. We really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you for your generosity. I'm I'm so happy to be able to to share this story with uh, with more people. Wonderful. And I'll see you later today on the radio. Thanks so much, everyone. 